In Karaika, the remote Siberian village Stalin was exiled to, he stayed in a room in a peasant hut owned by a family who lived in a different room with a kitchen. There were 15 of these huts in the village, and Zverdlov stayed in a room in another one. Ice and snow dominated the landscape for eight to nine months a year, and there was only an hour or two of daylight each day in the winter. Occasionally, a peasant neighbor would check in, and rarely some political prisoners from the Turukonsk prison colony, about 150 miles away, would come to visit Stalin and Sverdlov. One of these political exiles, Vera Schweizer, wrote about a visit she and Sern Spandarian made. Quote, During that part of the year, day and night merge into one endless arctic night pierced with cruel frosts. We sped down the Yenisei by dog sled without a stop, across the bleak wilderness that lies beyond Monastirskoy and Karaika, a dash of 200 kilometers, pursued by the continuous howling of wolves. Comrade Stalin was overjoyed at our unexpected arrival, and did all he could to make the Arctic travelers comfortable. The first thing he did was to run to the Yenisei, where his fishing lines were set in holes through the ice. A few minutes later, he returned with a huge sturgeon flung across his shoulder. Under the guidance of this experienced fisherman, we quickly dressed the fish, extracted the caviar, and prepared some fish soup. And while these culinary activities were in progress, we kept up an earnest discussion of party affairs. In a corner was stacked fishing and hunting tackle of various kinds, which he himself had made. Murphy. He was on good terms with the locals, who called him Osip, and they were the ones that showed him how to fish in the Yenisee River. Gray. Once in the winter, he got lost in a snowstorm on the way home, encountering two local peasants who ran away from him. He didn't know why, but later found out that, quote, his face had been so covered with snow and ice that they had thought he was a goblin. Gray. He was largely cut off from the outside world. Between long stretches of time, he received letters from the Alleluyevs, telling him about Lenin and the workers in St. Petersburg and the oil fields in Baku. While in Turukansk, they had sent him warm clothes and money. In 1915, he wrote to Olga, Sergei's wife, quote, expressing thanks and asking them not to spend their much-needed money on him. Gray. But he did request some postcards with local scenery, as he wanted to see some natural scenes that differed from his harsh surroundings. Newspapers and books would get to him months after they were published, so Stalin and Sverdlov waited and watched, to the extent that they could. The circulation of Pravda went from roughly 40,000 copies daily to around half that, and the open break with the Mensheviks in the Duma was supposedly a significant factor. The Akrana was also arresting all the Bolsheviks they could. By October 1916, things were not going well at the front, with casualties heavy enough that the government began calling on political exiles. Stalin was ordered to report to Krasnoyarsk, meaning a substantial journey in winter conditions. He had his medical exam in early 1917, and was declared unfit for service due to the deformity in his left arm. Plus, as he told the Alleluyevs, the authorities considered him an undesirable element in the army. Since there were only a few months left on his sentence, he was allowed to stay in a small town on the Trans-Siberian Railway line called Dechinsk, instead of being sent back to Turukonsk. Lev Kamenev and his wife, Olga, Trotsky's sister, were also staying there, and Stalin would often visit in the evenings. The members of the Second International had agreed in a 1912 conference resolution that, if war were to break out, they should make efforts to bring it to an end quickly, and use the crises brought on by it to rouse the people to revolution against capitalism. But when the war actually came in July and August 1914, this did not happen, and the international working class movement was torn apart. Only one party in the international, the Bolsheviks, really opposed the war and stuck to the principles from the conference. The unions and socialist and labor parties of different countries mostly followed their own governments, except pacifists and a few small groups. The Bolshevik position was clear and vastly different from other parties. Two phrases can sum it up. Quote, transform the imperialist war into civil war. Quote, the enemy of the workers is the government at home. Murphy. Stalin read Lenin's resolution with satisfaction when it reached him, as it confirmed the ideas he had expressed himself long before to other exiles. Twenty-five years later, at the beginning of World War II, Stalin declared, quote, the resolution of 1914 holds good. Ibid. The first declaration by Lenin and the six members of the Bolsheviks in Geneva stated, quote, the European and World War bears the sharp marks of a bourgeois imperialist and dynastic war, a struggle for markets, for freedom to loot foreign countries, 
a tendency to put an end to the revolutionary movement of the proletariat and democracy within the separate countries, a tendency to fool, to disunite, to slaughter the proletariat of all countries by inflaming the wage slaves of the other for the benefit of the bourgeoisie. This is the only real meaning and significance of the war. Ibid. This point of view was endorsed by the Bolsheviks in Russia, who developed policies around it. Outside of Russia, Liebknecht and Luxembourg were big supporters of it too, but it was most significant for Russia. It was probably the most ripe for revolutionary change, as the chaos in the government hadn't gone away, feudalism was still present, and capitalist economic activity was speeding up and reproducing the conditions that led to the ideas behind the 1905 revolution. Due to the Russian Empire's backwardness, the war made demands on the government that they were unable to meet. Of the war on Russia's end, Murphy wrote, quote, The industrialists engaged on war production racketeered without interference. The peasants gave their sons to the war by the million, and the soldiers fought bravely despite stupendous losses. Slowly at first, then with increasing speed, the rear became incapable of maintaining supplies to the fighting forces. Regiment after regiment was left without guns or ammunition. At home, prices soared and real wages decreased, and rents increased to 200 and 300 percent of the pre-war level. Strikes had dropped off greatly at the beginning of the war, but came back, rising in frequency and scale. There were only 68 strikes, with 34,753 workers, from August to December of 1914, but this jumped to 1,410 strikes, with 1,086,364 workers during the same span in 1916. Quote, the spirit of defeatism spread both at the top and bottom of society. Ibid. At the top, some nobles assassinated Rasputin, and at the bottom, misery and hunger pushed the people to rise up. The latter forced the gentry of the Duma to call for the Tsar's abdication. The Tsar left St. Petersburg, now called Petrograd, for the army headquarters on March 8, 1917, following an interview with the Prime Minister, Protopopov, who tried to inform him of the serious situation in the country. That night, he wrote to his wife, quote, I shall take up dominoes in my spare time. My brain is resting here. No ministers, no troublesome questions demanding thought. I consider that this is good for me. Ibid. In Petrograd, there were food riots, which had only grown larger two days later, and the Cossacks were friendly to the rioters. Tsar Nicholas received a phone call at 9 p.m. that night, where he responded, I demand that the disorders in the capital shall be stopped tomorrow. Ibid. Of course, this was not going to happen. On March 11th, or 12th, the Volinsky regiment shot into the crowd before returning to their barracks, mutinying, and shooting one of their officers. This was the beginning of the revolution. The Tsar ordered the Duma, a conservative assembly, dissolved, but they instead created a so-called progressive bloc and formed a provisional government. This was after the head of the conservatives proper, Shulgin, told the Duma's president, Rodzienko, quote, to seize power before somebody else more dangerous took things in hand. Ibid. Soviets were created, with workers electing delegates and the former elected an executive committee. Kerensky, a member of the Duma and a leader of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, was one of the vice presidents. The crowds grew larger in the streets. The provisional government arrested Tsarist ministers, including Prime Minister Protopopov. On March 14th, the Tsar, with an escort, returned to Petrograd, where there was fighting in the streets. The next day, soldiers elected delegates to the Soviets, and other soldiers were sent to restore order. They did not obey their orders. Capitalists, lawyers, and gentry gathered around the provisional government, and Tsar Nicholas II abdicated the throne on March 15th. Two bodies were now in control, the provisional government of the Duma, led by Prince Lvov, and the Soviets. The former had not come from the people, and it was more, quote, an appendage Tsardom, Ibid. It continued the war and held to the treaties of the Tsarist regime. At home, its policy was in holding back the crowds and delaying changes until the Constituent Assembly, which it hesitated in calling together. Kerensky was the liaison officer for the Provisional Government with the Executive Committee of the Soviets. With this liaison in place, the Provisional Government would be head of the state and could prevent the revolution from going too far. Murphy wrote, quote, The liaison committee therefore became the means by which the government maintained organic contact with the masses, while the promise of the constituent assembly successfully devitalized the Soviets 
by the constant deferment of their domestic demands to a vague and nebulous future. Zardom was gone, but nothing had taken its place firmly. People were enjoying their new freedoms, but didn't know what would come next. The Bolsheviks may not have planned the uprising, but they viewed it as something that could not be planned. The revolution they wanted had to be timed just right with the rising of the people. They could not make a revolution in a non-revolutionary situation. They wouldn't have taken responsibility for the February, March, New Style, 1917 revolution, but they had substantially influenced the Russian working class that started it. They'd also been talking about the importance of preparing for the next revolution since 1905, going against the Mensheviks on this point. All the way back at the 1906 RSDLP Congress in Stockholm, Stalin had said on the leadership of the revolution, quote, either the hegemony of the proletariat or the hegemony of the democratic bourgeoisie. That is how the question stands in the party. That is where we differ. Ibid. Neither the Bolsheviks or Mensheviks had decided what role the Soviets should play, and both had thought the abdication of the Tsar would be followed by the creation of a Western-style democracy. In 1905, the Soviets had been little more than, quote, weapons of the political general strike, Ibid. But now, people everywhere, in the army, navy, towns, and villages, formed Soviets. Most of them did not know how to read or write, but thanks to the 1905 revolution and campaigns by social democrats, they knew how to organize themselves and the Soviets. When the revolution came, Lenin was in Geneva and Stalin in Siberia. When news of the Tsar's abdication reached the prison villages of Siberia, the guards left, and thousands of political exiles made their way home. Stalin and Sverdlov had no formal homes, of course, but made their way to Petrograd, where the former arrived on March 12, 1917, or March 25th. Sverdlov, Kamenev, and Kalinin would also arrive, and Lenin was reported to be on his way. Stalin received a warm welcome from the whole family when he visited the Alleluia of home. Sergei, Olga, their son Fedor, their older daughter Anna, and their younger 16-year-old daughter Nadezhda were all there. He answered questions about his time in Siberia and made them laugh with his impressions of the peasants who had met the train at every station. The next morning, Stalin took a train to the Pravda office, accompanied by Fedor, Anna, and Nadezhda, who were looking for a place to stay closer to the center of the city. When they went their separate ways, Stalin called out, quote, Don't forget to keep a room for me in the new apartment. Don't forget. Gray. The returned exiles resumed their work in Petrograd, but they were in a difficult position. For one thing, the current Russian bureau of the Central Committee decided to admit Stalin with only an advisory vote. Miranov, a former Bolshevik deputy, was given full membership despite lacking special abilities and record of service. The leaders at the time were Alexander Shlyapnikov and Molotov, who were worried they would be displaced by Stalin and Kamenev. Shlyapnikov later claimed the attempt to exclude them was due to their ambivalence toward the provisional government and the war. Gray wrote that, quote, It was a specious excuse, for Miranov was known to support the government and the policy of continuing the war. Quote, Stalin acted at once, showing a new authority. He was the senior party member present, and in ability he towered over Shlyapnikov and Molotov, whom he swept aside. Three days after his return, he was elected to the Bureau's Presidium with full voting rights and was appointed Bolshevik representative on the Executive Committee, XCOM, of the Petrograd Soviet of Workers' Deputies, Ibid. He and Kamenev took over Pravda as well. The party's Central Committee had put out a manifesto on March 18th, based on the old party program, and Pravda followed this with leading articles. A policy had already been created and implemented, which didn't address the problems arising from the revolution. The CC should have first found out if it was appropriate for the circumstances. Stalin and Kamenev faced conundrums when placed in charge of Pravda. Was this the bourgeois democratic revolution they'd worked toward? And if so, was the provisional government or the Soviets the real authority? Were they both temporary? The Bolsheviks were against the imperialist war, but they seemed to be largely alone on this. The provisional government was continuing the war, and the majority in the Soviets, who supported either Kerensky and the Socialist Revolutionary Party or the Mensheviks, were also for the war. Two days after his arrival, Stalin wrote in Pravda, quote, The Soviets had to hold on to the rights that have been won in order to finish off the old forces and, in conjunction with the provinces, advance the Russian Revolution still further. They must consolidate their position, make the Soviets universal, and 
and link them together under the aegis of the Central Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies as the organ of the revolutionary power of the people. Murphy. Two days later, he said, quote, We must tear the mask from the imperialists and reveal to the masses what is really behind the present war. But this means declaring real war on war. It means making the present war impossible. Ibid. At the end of the week, he was saying they should, quote, mobilize all the living forces of the people against the counter-revolution. The only body that can serve as this organ is a National Soviet of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies. Murphy described this writing as, quote, groping, and said that the difference between it and his typical, quote, lucid and emphatic style demonstrated his, quote, dissatisfaction with the position. Stalin and other leaders met Lenin at the Finland station in Petrograd on the evening of April 3rd, where there was more fanfare than usual, accompanying him to party headquarters. He was happy to be back in Russia, but in a hurry, and wondering what the problem was with the party leaders. Why the confusion and talk of supporting the provisional government insofar as in Pravda? On the way, Lenin addressed the crowd about the futility of defending the capitalist empire and the necessity of immediate peace. He stopped multiple times to do so, speaking against the war, the provisional government, and the Mensheviks as, quote, traitors to the cause of the proletariat, peace, and freedom. Gray. Many of the listeners were not pleased with his statements. Sukhanov overheard an angry soldier remark, quote, ought to stick our bayonets into a fellow like that. Must be a German. Ibid. Lenin hadn't foreseen the present situation in the revolution, but wasn't confused. He had been sending off letters from Geneva ever since learning of the revolution, though they didn't get to Pravda until he arrived and had written what would become known as his April Theses on the way home. He went straight from the rail station to party headquarters, where he delivered the theses to the leaders. Murphy remarked that, quote, No political bombshell ever burst with more telling effect. The document said, quote, The revolutionary proletariat could give their consent to a revolutionary war of defense only on condition, A, that all power was transferred to the proletariat and its ally, the poorest sector of the peasants, B, that all annexations be renounced in deeds, not merely in words. C. A complete break with all interests of capital. The present situation represents a transition from the first stage of the revolution to its second stage, which is to place all power in the hands of the proletariat in the poorest strata of the peasants. Hence, no support can be given to the provisional government. The Bolsheviks are in a minority in the Soviets. They must win the majority. No longer do we want a parliamentary republic, for that would mean a step backward. We must go forward to a republic of Soviets of workers, agricultural laborers, and peasant deputies. We must nationalize the land and merge the banks into one great national bank controlled by the Soviets. Our immediate task is not to introduce socialism, but to bring all production under the control of the Soviet government. The confusion in the party must be ended by a party convention, which will change the program of the party and bring it into line with the needs of the revolution. There wasn't much resistance to this though it wasn't popular at first, but, quote, Kamenev, who in all crises proved himself more a Menshevik than a Bolshevik, led what fight there was. Ibid. Stalin listened. He talked it over with Lenin, recognized that the latter's position was correct for the present reality, and lined up with him. Years later, Stalin said of the situation, quote, It is no wonder that the Bolsheviks, having been scattered by Tsarism into prison and exile, and only now able to come together from all the ends of Russia to work out a new platform, could not in one stroke find their way in the new situation. I shared my mistaken viewpoint with the majority of the party, and surrendered it fully about the middle of April, adopting Lenin's April theses. Ibid. None of the Bolshevik leaders had agreed with Lenin, because what he suggested was so profound that it changed the entire party program. The party was, or had been, in crisis, but Lenin got it back into line behind him. One may wonder where Trotsky was in all of this. He was not a member of the Bolshevik party, and was still in self-imposed exile in the U.S., where he demanded, quote, no czar, but a worker's government, which Lenin called, quote, playing at seizing power. Ibid. Sukhanov described Stalin during this time as a, quote, gray blur, and Trotsky, who arrived in May, called him a, quote, plebeian democrat and oafish provincial forced by the spirit of the times to assume the Marxist tinge. Gray. On the contrary, Gray described Stalin during this time like this, quote, while the others were making speeches and contending for the center of the stage, he was always present, 
stable as a foundation stone, working within the party organization. Far from being a gray blur, he was gaining the respect and confidence of members, as was shown at the Seventh Party Conference in late April, when he received the third highest number of votes after Lenin and Zinoviev in a secret ballot for the Central Committee. Ibid. He also delivered his report on the nationalities at this conference. The Bolsheviks still had to prepare for the coming insurrection, but now they knew that they had to prepare, and how to prepare. Lenin and his April theses illuminated the road to the October Revolution.